Hello everyone, my name is Lara and I am the founder and editor of Muse Factory Magazine. We are a magazine dedicated to highlighting the life and the work of artists and also celebrating different cultures around the world. Today I'm coming to you with a conversation I had last night with an Iraqi Jewish punk rock musician, Lulwa Khazoum. Lulwa has been active in the last five years with her band Iraqis in Pajamas, and they fuse traditional liturgical Iraqi Jewish music with also punk rock. Um, and recently they actually released a single called Cancer Is My Engine, which talks about Lulwa's life and her diagnosis and how um, that has shaped her music um, in the years since she was diagnosed. Um, she is not only a musician, though she does play 11 different instruments, she's also a prolific writer. Um, she has a strong online presence and she's been published in Huffington Post, The Forward, and also Rolling Stone. Um, she's also the founder of the Jewish Multicultural Project, so I'm really excited. Um, we did cover a little bit of everything that I just mentioned in our conversation, so I hope you enjoy. Um, Lulwa, thank you for joining me. Thank um, you for inviting me. Of course. Um, so just to start off, um, can you give us a little bit of just background about like how you grew up and how you, you know, associate with your Iraqi Jewish heritage and how that influenced you, you know, just culturally, you know, with, within your identity, but also within your music? Sure. So I grew up in San Francisco in a very headstrong Iraqi Jewish home. We moved to San Francisco specifically because there was a Jewish school there. We moved from Montreal mm -hmm. and my dad was, um, he had gotten a position at Stanford, which is like an hour away from San Francisco, but at the time there were no Jewish schools there. So we mm -hmm. moved to San Francisco so my sister and I could go to a Jewish school. And uh, everything that we learned was Ashkenazi. So we would come home and my dad would say, what did you learn? We learned about Hanukkah. We don't say Hanukkah, we say Hanukkah. What did you learn about Hanukkah? We play with dreidels. We don't play with dreidels, you know, just on and on. And so I actually like wondered, why do we bother going to school when we have to unlearn and relearn everything when we get home? Um, while I was growing up, I gravitated very strongly towards the religious and cultural traditions. Um, I was very honored when my dad invited me when I was six to lead the Qadus, the Shabbat ritual, or, uh, you know, the Habdalah, or the different ceremonies. I was always super thrilled to do that. Um, when I was, um, when I was growing up, because I was a girl, even though I could, by the age of eight, I could lead an entire service, not only very well, but with the traditional Iraqi pronunciation. And it was extremely rare for anyone in my generation to first of all know the service, and second of all, to be able to do it with the Iraqi pronunciation. My generation was busy running away from all of it. Uh, but because I was a girl, everyone always tried to shut me down. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up with this constant conflict that I had this tremendous passion for my heritage and I threw myself into learning everything. And I used to also, you know, we went to a synagogue that was all the non-Ashkenazim went there. So mm -hmm. whatever background you were from. And I always like to talk to the old people and ask them their stories and teach me your songs and what are your traditions and but this thirst was just denigrated because I was female. Mm. Uh, so by the time I was 14, I just stopped going to synagogue. And um, in my home, we would sing the shpachoth, the, uh, the religious songs on Friday night, Saturday. We just sing for hours and hours and hours and hours. Um, I also, on Shabbat, I would love studying the halakha. I would love studying the, for example, the shatacha, the, the Passover Haggadah. Mm -hmm. I was very adamant about learning the exact pronunciation. And I was born a musician. I started singing before I started talking. So I've always had an excellent ear. And when I would be learning with my dad, you know, he'd say a passage, I'd say a passage. He said, great. And I'd say, no, that wasn't great do it again. So he'd do it again and I repeat and he's like, wonderful. I'm like, no, do it again. And I, just, 
over and over and over and over wow. until I knew that I had nailed it with the pronunciation. Wow. Um, and then, you know, I got flack for that. So, so there's an assumption that if you're American, you're going to speak in an Ashkenazi pronunciation. Why? Nobody in America grows up speaking Hebrew conversationally. Right. We learn it. So it's a choice. It's a decision. It's a political decision. How are you going to learn it? What right. pronunciation are you going to learn? So I was ridiculed. People couldn't understand me. Some combination thereof. Um, it became very challenging because I knew that I was preserving the original pronunciation of Hebrew. You know, what I taught people in the decades that I was a Jewish multicultural educator, they would always think I was praying in Arabic. I said, okay, let's break this down. Where does Hebrew come from? The Middle East. Great. Right. So Hebrew makes sounds of Semitic languages. So Jews who stayed in the Middle East and North Africa continued to be able to make these sounds. Jews who ended up in Central Eastern Europe were speaking Slavic and Germanic languages. They didn't make these sounds. So then you had what is known as the double letters. There were no double letters. There was yeah. an Aleph and there was an Ayin. It's distinct. There was a Kaf and there was an Oath. Distinct. Yeah. But they lost the letters. And yet that loss became the standard of Hebrew. And therefore, if you were not speaking that, not only were you misunderstood or ridiculed, but in Israel, you might not get a job because you were thought right. of as lower. I mean, it's twisted shit. You, you said that you were like rehearsing with your father and you kind of really wanted to nail the pronunciation. So how early did you kind of, you know, were you exposed to the language like your whole life or was it something that you had to go and you asked your father like, no, speak to me in the Judeo-Arabic? Like, well, how did that work? Well, well both. Mm -hmm. uh, liturgically, religiously, I was exposed to it my whole life, mm -hmm. but we only spoke English at home. And my dad, you know, my dad my whole life spoke five languages. And I asked him in high school, I said, why didn't you ever talk to us in Hebrew or Judeo-Arabic? And he said, oh, it's a waste of time because everybody speaks English today. And I was like, but I don't want to be speaking in my language. I want to be speaking in the language of the person I'm talking to so that I can hear their heart and their soul. You know, there's like things get lost in translation. And I was like, talk about a waste of time. I'm like busy running around taking all of these classes now to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did not speak any language except English. I prayed in Hebrew and Judeo-Arabic, but I didn't actually know what I was saying. Mm -hmm. um, I was pulled out of Hebrew school in second grade because of the racism and the taunting from the teachers and wow. uh, the shaming. Um, and so I grew up going to public school and I only spoke English. And I actually ended up being glad because when I finally became fluent in Hebrew and I realized that I was saying, Dear Lord in heaven, who we are all terrified of. And, you know, I was like, oh, my God, that is just so not my experience of a relationship to God. So I consciously blocked out. Like, I kind of went back to the way that the prayers always were for me, which is like a river. It was just this river just flowing through me or flowing over me. And it was very much a meditation. And it's right. kind of like, you know, there's a lot of people who they listen to mantra music or whatever. They don't know what the hell they're saying. And yeah. so people get... People get kind of shocked when they find out, you know, I don't know what I'm praying. And they're like, well, how can you pray that? And it's like, because the prayer to me is my soul talking directly to God. It's, it's like my own emotional, psyche, spiritual experience. And this is the language of my ancestors. These are the chants of my ancestors. I think there's something energetically that gets conveyed um, just in uttering those words. I don't need to know what they mean. And like I said, now I could go through and my, because I, because I learned the prayers when I didn't know what they mean, mm -hmm. I recite it like that. You know, it's, it's that primary or primal relationship to it. I could go through and dissect it, but when I do it, just, I don't relate to it half the time. The other half of the time it irritates me. And it's not, it's not what prayers came to be for me. Prayers came to be a very personal interaction with God. Right. And so you, would you describe yourself now as religious, spiritual, like, is it a daily thing for you? Like, um, how often, you know, do you kind of do that sort of prayer med meditation? I pray every day. Oh, you so do. I'm not, I'm not Orthodox. 
anymore. Um, I grew up Orthodox. When I was in my early 20s, I mostly struggled with ideas about women and women's roles. And I kind of had a conversation with myself because a lot of things just did not feel, they did not sit with me as being authentically soulful or right. my or my innate understanding of God or relationship to God. And, and I kind of thought through it and I was like, well, who said these things about women or who said that this is what God said or wants? These rabbis, well, who told these rabbis? They're rabbis. Well, who told those rabbis? They're rabbis. And oh, look, they're all men. So yeah. I just, I just, you know, did a lot of deep soul searching and I was like, you know what? This doesn't feel authentic to me. This doesn't to me feel like an authentic expression of Judaism. And I'm not going to just do it because I was told to. And I actually broke Shabbat and Hag on Shabbat of Yom Kippur. Like you, you could not double up on... <laughs> So like if you're here. gonna go out, go out hard. Um, <laughs> and I actually said to God, I was freaking terrified because I didn't know, you know, lightning bolt strike. I had no idea. Yeah. I was terrified. So and I was, I was a good girl my whole life, you know. And um, and I said to God, I was like, look, I'm not gonna bullshit you. Like I have evolved to this place now that I feel very strongly. I don't believe in this anymore. Like these particular practices. And therefore, I'm going to turn on the light on Yom Kippur, Shabbat of Yom Kippur, because this is who I am. You want to judge me? Here. Yeah. This is who I am. Judge me like this. I'm not going to pretend. And so I'm sure that, you know, the spectrum of people, I find so often that, that what someone thinks of you really reflects more of their own belief system than about you. So I think it really depends on who you ask, whether they're going to think I'm religious or not, everything about who I am, my soul, my orientation, my way of approaching things, my way of thinking about things is very Jewish. It came from deep contemplation. Uh, when I was even as young as 16, I, um, I was questioning Judaism a lot. Um, I was basically like an Orthodox existentialist Jew, which people just didn't understand. Um, you know, I, I considered leaving Judaism, but then I thought, well, before I do that, I should really immerse myself. And I went to Israel and I studied with a Sephardic rabbi from Spain, fell in love with Judaism in a very active way and, and took it on in a very active way, not just because it was handed down to me, but because I actively chose, mm -hmm. this is my religion, this is my belief system. So Throughout my day, the rituals are there, you know, um, the washing my hands three times before saying Hamasi. I say the Qadus every Friday night, every Saturday. I say Habdallah every Saturday night, um, you know, so, but it's beyond, it's beyond the rituals. People can do rituals and just be numb. And that's a lot of actually what I discovered orthodoxy to be is a lot of people with a lot of hypocrisy. And of course, there's the people who are not hypocrites and they're very immersed in it and they're very awake yeah. to it. I, I want to say that, but I'm just, I'm just saying that, you know, people look at, I think often their um, evaluation of whether someone is quote unquote religious is, are you doing this? Are you doing that? Are you doing the right. other thing? And I find you can do all of that and you can be a total asshole and you're not living the spirit of Judaism. So exactly. for me, it's very much an orientation towards life. Um, and then there's all these practices which just keep me grounded. And like, you know, it took somebody in my twenties telling me, she's like, wow, it's like you walk around with the weight of the world. And I only then realize most people don't walk around with 4,000 years on their shoulders. And I have just always had this consciousness of my ancestors and my people and my nation and my religion. And it's always been there. This, despite the fact that I have always been very immersed in general society, my friends have been all different religious backgrounds and ethnicities, but I have always walked very grounded and strong and proud in being a Jew. So my family speaks this um, kind of Persian Jewish dialect, and um, there was a class assignment in Hebrew school to to um, 
to speak with your grandparents and, and learn some Yiddish words. And so we all came back. <laughs> Right. We all came back and I thought my grandmother spoke Yiddish because I was a kid and I didn't realize, you know, that there's, you know, we just called it Jewish, our, our language. Um, uh, so I just thought, okay, this, this must be what Yiddish is, this, this thing that they call Yiddish. So I went to my grandmother, I started, I'm like, grandma, speak Jewish to me. You know, wrote down some phrases, went to school and people were like, what is this? This is not like, <laughs> and then I was like, and, and you know, um, the kids were like, saying some like some Yiddish words um things like bubula and you know like little like sweet things that their grandparents would call them and be like no my grandma calls me Juni like that's completely like and they're like what are you talking about and so from there I realized I'm like okay we're a little bit different <laughs> um and I had to come to learn just how different and and had that the histories are are you know we, we share a common thread right but we're we are still um you know different groups within within the larger tribe so um i resonate a lot with that reminds me of when yeah. i was when i was six years old and i was in school so while we didn't speak anything but english there were certain words we only said in either hebrew or judeo-arabic but i didn't know which was which yeah. and i i had awareness like consciousness even at the age of six that there would be a certain amount of embarrassment associated with if I said a Judeo-Arabic word. So the teacher said, how do you say, you know, when someone sneezes, how do you say bless you in mm -hmm. Hebrew? Yeah. And I was like, okay, what I know we say is labriyut. I don't know if that's Hebrew or Judeo-Arabic. So I just stayed quiet. I, rem I was six, I'm 51. I remember yeah. this to this day because that's how pointing it was like this this socialization that runs so deep and starts so early and then i remember that uh nobody knew the answer and the teacher said it's la briute and i was like oh yeah. like it was like this moment where i was like but i knew the answer and but wait i'm not comfortable with the fact that i wasn't comfortable saying it if it was judeo-arabic and i knew the the reason i remember that moment to this day is i knew something was wrong something was wrong yeah. in that interchange and you know i was just six so i didn't have the full download yeah. on that yeah but even in just that very small interaction and knowing that if i said quote unquote the wrong phrase right that i would get some shit for it in school it was clear from the outset Mm. that anything not Ashkenazi would be denigrated. Mm. So even though my family had the pride, and again, mm. there were ways there was pride, there were ways that there wasn't. I mean, even like on the level yeah. of my dad trying to erase his accent, you know? Right, um, right. So there's very subtle cues that you get as a child, and there's a lot of confusion. So how did you, you said that you got, you started singing before you started talking. And so how did this play out throughout your life? And kind of what was your first in, like formal introduction to music? Um, what was kind of like your, what was the trajectory of like what got you to the point that you said, okay, I'm a musician. I'm not just, you know, musical anymore. I'm, I'm really a musician. So can you um, talk a little bit about that? And then we'll kind of go into um, the song and Iraqis in pajamas and, and all of yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very long story and it's a very long journey. I'll try to just hit some of the headlines. So my mom said that when I was three months old, she was driving in the car and I was in, what do you call it? The bassinet that the little babies the, are in? The car seat, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was in the car seat and I started singing one of the shpechot, not with words, but, you know, I was humming it and it was very distinctly, it was very clearly one mm -hmm. of the shpechot. And she said she nearly had an accident looking in the rear view mirror and she said I was like bouncing back and forth and I was singing one of the shpechot. So that was the first you know, that, that happened. Like I was actually, you know, again, singing, humming, whatever, distinct melodies of the Shpachot before I started talking. Um, in Iraq, at least in the Iraqi Jewish community, I can't speak to the Muslim or Christian communities. Uh, being a musician was considered being a prostitute. Everyone on my mm -hmm. dad's side is very musical. Mm -hmm. Nobody's a musician. Mm -hmm. Um, was very discouraged, especially for women. Mm. I do not remember a day in my life that I wasn't making up music 
trying to play other people's instruments and begging my parents for a piano. Mm. Uh, I remember I was probably three. I have a freakishly long and sharp memory. I remember when I was three, I was sitting on a piano bench next to my friend and just, I was just like transfixed. I was just oh, like in awe of the piano. And then she said, do you want me to teach you how to play it? And it was like someone had just opened a door to a magical wonderland. We had this uh, plastic organ mm. in my house. And I used to just constantly make up songs on this plastic organ. And anyhow, so, so I was begging my parents for a piano. We lived in an apartment in Montreal. They said, uh, when we move into a house, you can have a piano. Mm. Then when I was five, we left Montreal. We moved into a house in San Francisco. And I said, now can I have a piano? And they said, well, we're renting the house. When we buy a house, you can have a piano. Mm -hmm. Then when I was six, they bought a house. We moved in. I said, now can I have a piano? <laughs> I didn't realize they were just blowing me off. <laughs> and, and they said, if you can save up the money for a piano, you can have one. And I wow. said, okay. <laughs> now, my parents did not give us allowance. They had what they called the behavior modification system. They gave us wow. pluses and minuses. Yeah. Every plus was five cents. So if you, you know, vacuum the whole house, you get 20 pluses, which is a dollar. If you talk back to them, you get like, you know, 20 minuses, right? Wow. So I became a domestic slave. I was making <laughs> dinner. I was vacuuming. I was cleaning toilet bowls, like anything I could get my hands on. And I had this Mickey Mouse puzzle box. And every time I'd get my money from my pluses, I would count it. And when I was eight years old, two things happened. We moved into a new house. And I had, at that point, $300. And I went to my parents with a wad of $300. And I said, now can I have a piano? And again, in retrospect, I understand they were blowing me off the whole time. And I, I, I know now that in that moment, they understood I was very serious yeah. and I really, really needed a piano. <laughs> so we went to a uh, used piano store and we found a piano for $500. They contributed 200, I contributed 300. And then they put me in Yamaha music school. And within weeks I was the assistant teacher and the, the Yamaha teacher um, called my parents and she's like, your child does not belong here. She belongs at the conservatory. Wow. So my mom uh, took me for a tryout at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. And uh, the director of the school uh, was the one who auditioned everyone. And so she auditioned me. And I didn't know this until later. She left the room and she sat next to my mom. She said, where have you been keeping her? <laughs> <laughs> and, wow. and I was immediately enrolled. And then I studied flute and piano for my whole childhood. Mm -hmm. Um, but the emphasis was always academics, you know, mm -hmm. you have to, it, look, it was never said, but mm -hmm. it was always understood. You get straight A's, you take all honors in AP classes, and you go to like an Ivy League college. Like this was just, this is the blueprint, <laughs> you know. Right. Meanwhile, I played like, I think 11 different instruments. So I was studying flute and piano at the conservatory, but then at school I was playing guitar and violin and timpani wow. and French horn. And what else did I play? Uh, well, piccolo, um, I can't remember, trumpet. Did I mention trumpet? Um, no, I was didn't. just like <laughs> guitar, I played guitar. Just, I loved sound. And I, um, I really was a composer, um, but, you know, they didn't, they didn't really listen to your soul. They were kind of like, they just, I don't know, assumed you're going to study an instrument or something. And um, so I was terrible at practicing. Uh, I really just wanted to explore and experience sound. Mm. And I was always writing. I had reams of partially finished compositions because what would happen is I'd start writing something and then whatever I was writing would spark another idea. And then I was like, oh, and then I'd flip the page. And I did this all manually, like treble clef, bass clef. You know, I was writing wow. notes by hand. Flip the page and I'd start another thing. And then the process of writing that thing would spark another idea. And I'd go, oh, flip the page, start reams. I had like reams. And then finally, um, we had, uh, 
we had like some, I don't know, there was, you know, they were very serious at the conservatory. I mean, even for the prep department, which was the, you know, the kids up through high school, you know, it was very competitive and demanding and everything. And so we had some kind of a performance or something. And, and I was like, okay, I'm going to finish one thing for this performance. So I did a, oh, it's so funny. I'm realizing that there's a relevance to the ethnic thing here. I did a, a flute trio mm -hmm. and it was called Musica Marklathi, which is a Judeo-Arabic for music for three. Mm. Um, and it's interesting in retrospect because the harmonies were very sharp. I love sharp harmonies, like not, not soft and nice. I like, it's harmonic and it makes you like, what the hell is going on? You know, it's like awakening. I like awakening things. So no surprise, I ended up in punk rock. With the Cancer Is My um, Engine song, at, at the end, I mean, you're, the way that your voice carries, I mean, you, you had that really nice marriage of the punk rock and the, um, and the Iraqi music. Before I ask you to comment on that, can you b backtrack a little bit? Um, so you were at this conservatory and you're writing these songs and you're having all of these, you, you know, these awesome ideas. Meanwhile, you, you know, you say that you grew up in a very proud Iraqi Jewish home and you're learning the Judeo Arabic and the correct pronunciation and all, all of that. At what point in your journey did you start to really think about Iraqi Jewish music? Like, where did you kind of, were you always interested in it because you grew up in this proud home where you were always kind of aware of your heritage? Or did you kind of fall into it and... Um, you know, was there like a certain age where you kind of had a turning point where you decided that you wanted to learn these like Middle Eastern rhythms? Like, how did that connection happen? It was all part of the landscape of my life. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was playing Bach on piano and I was singing these ancient Iraqi Jewish prayers. Um, and they were just all there, but they weren't intersecting. Now, what's really funny is my mom kept telling me, I'm just petting my cat, she, she wants attention. Oh. <laughs> what's really funny is my mom kept telling me when I, when I played piano, she's like, why don't you compose something that's, you know, the Iraqi Jewish prayers? And I'm like, mom, leave me alone. <laughs> now, I did do things like, um, on my bath muswa, I, um, I played, uh, Iraqi Purim song on my flute. You know, there were kind of like a few places here and there. Mm -hmm. But mostly I was like, nah, leave me alone, you know, like <laughs> I want to do shit normally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and when I say that, I need to make a caveat because it's like, you know, there's how much am I going into the weeds again? But there's I want to do things normally. It just mostly means like stop bugging me about having to like do this blend I just want to fucking like play this piece or create right. whatever comes out of me and I think because there was a it was a pressure I yeah. didn't want to do it I'm like fuck you leave me alone you exactly, know yeah. but I laugh at that because I know that you know it's just really funny that this is where I ended up not because of that but just various choices and circumstances and ebbs and flows of my life. Um, I mean, that leads to the story of Ofer Haza. So Ofer Haza exploded yeah. on the international music scene when I was in college and I was obsessed with her. I spent three years like stalking her and this was before we had, you know, internet and all this. And I just, I would contact Yemeni Jewish centers and New York and in Israel and I was just constantly pursuing her and the closest I got was well at that time the closest I got was um I found out that one of her musicians worked at this Israeli restaurant in New York where I was living and so <laughs> I went to go talk to him and he had just quit like a couple weeks earlier and oh, nobody no. knew how to find him and I was like no and then after I graduated college um my, I went to go visit my best friend who was still in college. She was, she was a few years behind me and she was, you know, running some Jewish organization at the time. And, and they had, um, arranged for Ofer Haza to come and perform, but it was all sold out. And I was like, fuck. And then at the last minute, someone got sick. So I got her oh. ticket. So we go there and the seats were way up in back and and I was just kind of standing there like, um, just 
like skiving and conniving, like, like I, I'm like going crazy. I need to meet this woman and this is too far away. And then I found there are these two seats in the front row that nobody had. And I, you know, pulled my best friend there and we were sitting there and then Ofahaza came out and she just had like, just like pearls. It's like she opened her mouth and just pearls came out. And there was just, mm -hmm. there was no technical anything. This was just straight acapella. And, you know, so she was the first one who mixed, um, you know, the, the Middle Eastern Jewish prayers with quote unquote contemporary music. I mean, we're contemporary too. So right. that's a problematic term, but I'm just saying kind of like pop music. So, so she did like dance music and you know I love dancing I went to nightclubs all the time and and Ofrahaza would play so that was really cool anyhow so she was she was singing and I was going nuts that stage was like really low and I started thinking what if I just like run on the stage so we were at an inter we were at an intermission and I'm hanging out with my friends and I'm just like I'm kind of eyeballing the stage and stuff my friends <laughs> like what what what's going on with you and I'm like wow I'm just thinking that stage really low and I'm I'm thinking about jumping on it. And this wasn't my best friend. This was another uh, woman I was friendly with. She goes, let's do it. And I'm like, really? She's like, yeah. Oh so she starts running to the stage and I get super excited and I end up running past her and the security guards start charging down oh the hallways. God. You know, Israeli events always have tons of security, right? So I dove under the curtain. I heard her get caught and I just kept running, running, running. And then, and I heard them pursuing me and I end up like just opening a door and running into this room where all the dancers were. <laughs> it's a whole long story. I won't continue with it, but it's pretty hilarious. And oh I, ended up, I ended up meeting her manager and I met her and I had this picture of her, um, her and me on my wall um, for years. I had it also when I was teaching Jewish multiculturalism, I had that picture on the wall in the classroom. And she thought it was hilarious, like when I told her that. So she was really my first role model because I didn't really have anybody who had anything. Like there was, there was, you know, all these heroes and whatever, they didn't have anything to do with me. Mm -hmm. And she was somebody who, you know, she was from my heritage. She's a musician. She was taking that music and she was combining it with dance music, which I love. And uh, anyhow, so again, there was no direct, there was no A, goes to B, goes to C. It wasn't like, right. oh, Ofra Haza, I'm going to do that shit. No, that was just like something that was there. What happened for me was I lost my music. So I kept having this journey where I'd get really into my music. I'd start a band. I'm like, I got to do my music. And then I would get distracted. And then I'd be like, where the fuck did my music go? And then I get really invigorated again. I go start another band and I go do it. And this just kept happening. And then... Uh, 2010, I was diagnosed with cancer. I chose yeah. to reject the conventional option of surgery. I chose to see the diagnosis as an opportunity to do very profound healing and transformation in my life. Just, just look at what do I need? You know, how do I self heal? Right. And cancer was almost irrelevant. It was just kind of the catalyst. And I was like, where can I shine the flashlight? And, and mind you, I was a very awake very healed person. Um, I even went to the extent of I built a bottle smashing range in my backyard in my early 20s and I got all my angries out. I was radically committed to wow. healing and self-expression. So I wasn't one of these kinds of people who's walking around sleepwalking and then the universe has to hit you upside the head to wake you up. I was very awake. I was always doing things I was passionate about and that I loved. But what happened was I approached it as, okay, more, deeper, more healing. Where, where can I, where can I heal now? What else do I need to do? And, and, and using it as an opportunity. So I got, I got an ultrasound every three to six months. Initially, I radically altered my diet. So I went organic, vegan, no soy, no gluten, no fried foods, no sweeteners of any wow. kind. Yeah. Literally overnight. It was brutal. But, um, immediately following that, I just cold stopped the growth of the nodules. Every three to six months, I'd add something else because if it, you know, it was stable, great. It didn't grow, but it also didn't shrink. So I was like, okay, now what? Now what? Every six months, what now? What now? What now? And then there came a point and I was doing a meditation and a piano, a piano emerged in my meditation. And there's a whole story there too, but something supernatural happened. 
Long and short of it is I realized yet again, I had lost my music. It was 13 years since I had played music. I even forgot I was a musician. Wow. I was like, to the extent that I, I forgot <laughs> that wow. music was a part of my life. And, and I had this really radical, radical decision that I was like, I am going to devote myself to my music and I'm never going to let it gather dust again. And I also hated where I was living. I moved to Seattle. I started this band. Right. I read about that. Yeah. 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 And shortly after that, the nodules started shrinking. Well, okay. So now I have this band and I went to, I was just writing alternative rock. Everyone always told me it sounded like there was Middle Eastern influence. I couldn't hear it, mm -hmm. but you know, for me, that's like part of the landscape of my ears. Right. So it's possible I was doing Middle Eastern-y stuff and I didn't really hear it. And I wrote the first song that combined the Iraqi Jewish prayers with the alternative and punk rock. And it was called Conformity. Mm. And it has a very simple line. It says, I wanted the cohesion of community, but the price was conformity. So that was the first song that I did. And I did it to a Sukkot song, Eli Eli Lama. And, um, it, that song has the, the full words of Eli Eli Lama. A lot of my songs have snippets. They have like a sentence or they have a paragraph or they have, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there. That one is like the full on song. Um, and I wanted the cohesion of community, but the price was conformity. It just kind of weaves through the song, but it's a punk rock version of the original song. And mm -hmm. the reason I chose that song was because um, it was an absolute favorite during the years I was a Jewish multicultural educator. Everybody loved that song. And there was actually a uh, Kala conference, which is a Jewish renewal conference that I was at. And people were like following me like the Pied Piper. I had taught them that song. And then there was a long line of people with drums singing the song with me as I was walking around the campus. And that's why I chose that song. So how long has it been now that you've been doing, that you started this band, Iraqis in, in Pajamas? And five years. Five years. And how did that, like, how did that come about? How did you meet the band members? Um, did you guys know each other prior? What I did was I started, I can't remember which came first. I know that I started putting out ads on Craigslist, but I also started going to open mics. And, you know, I played bass. Mm. And it's very awkward to sing punk rock songs on a bass without a band yeah <laughs> one day one day I got up and I said exactly that to the crowd in the open mic I said you know it's very awkward to do this but fuck it and everybody went yeah <laughs> and I started just singing my songs with just the bass and then and then that became like my thing. And I was always the only one doing that, you know, here, especially Seattle's very singer songwriter and everybody's always singing these really moody, you know, cafe kind of songs. And then I come in and I'm like, ah! <laughs> you know? and I'm like the only, like I'm on a bass and, and, and it's very unusual also for women to be playing bass. And so I started doing that. And then I, I, you know, I would, meet other guitarists and you know i put out ads and and the first rendition of the band did not stick um we wrote some really great music but uh the guitarist i'm sorry the drummer's son um kept getting surgeries and he had to drop out and the guitarist came in with him and he left after as well and then there was stuff i moved to hawaii and then i came back and i moved into the forest so i'm now outside seattle um, and then I started the band again, again through Craigslist. And then there were a few renditions. It was like, there was, there was a lot of turnover for a while. Mm. There was a lot of turnover and it was really tough. And I, rem I was reminded why I stopped doing my music. It is a pain in the ass to keep a band together. And excuse me, especially because I'm doing really weird music. You know, it's like alternative and punk rock with Iraqi Jewish prayers there's not a lot of musicians who can pull that shit right. off. Right, it's very specific, yeah. Yeah, and my way of doing it is I write the lyrics and I write the melody and I write the bass line and then I bring it to the band and I like the guitarist and drummer just coming up with their own shit, but we have to have a similar musical sensibility or it doesn't work. Mm. And then it's this very organic creation where we're all 
contributing something unique to the sound. So only because I made this promise to myself, because I was really determined, I was like, I'm not going to let it go this time. I am not, it was like I was a pit bull, you know, just like hanging on. Yeah. Yeah. And it took years. And then what happened was, you know, I was running a PR company. So I was supporting myself and taking care of my mom. She had a traumatic brain injury in 2008 and I was taking care of her. So I had to make a shit ton of money. And so I was running a PR company and working constantly with that. And then I lost my mom and I was totally crushed. And I tried to go back to PR and I couldn't. I felt like there was a there was a repug- repulsive magnet around it that was not letting me go back. And I felt my mother like a force field pulling me into my music. I'm going to get teary eyed. Mm. And I heard her say, it's time. And, and I decided I was going to really throw myself into it. So I looked at my credit cards. I was like, well, I can last about six months. And so I just built it up and we released, uh, oh, and I got a grant. I applied for a grant from the Lloyd Symington Foundation and Healing Journeys, which is an organization for people living with and healing from cancer, uh, was the fiscal sponsor. So we had like nonprofit status and then Lloyd Symington Foundation funds innovative programs for people living with and healing from cancer. So they, uh, they gave the funding to create the song and the music video. So we released the song on March 1st. We had all these gigs lined up and then the world went sideways and everything came to a grinding halt. Yeah. And then we picked up the music video again in the summer. And it was really cool though, because the, the prayer that's incorporated is from the high holidays. And we actually recorded the music video not on the high holidays, but during, you know, during yeah. the Yamim Noraim. So that was pretty cool that I was standing on the cliff, building out that prayer, and it was actually in between Rishana and Yom Kippur. Thank you for, for you know, being open enough to, to be able to share that with, sure. with me. The song is called Cancer is My Engine, and you hear that kind of, you know, from the beginning, that, that, mel- that melody coming in. Um, what does it mean when you say that it's your engine? I have a couple of ideas, but I want to hear it from you. Like what, like, is it kind of like a driving force? If you could explain that, that would be awesome. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are before I answer. I think to me, I felt that it was kind of like, um, and it's also kind of came together when you said that your your mom said, it. you know, it's time to 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 do your music. But like you said, when, even though you felt that you were awake, right, um, your whole life, but you, you know, you kind of got this diagnosis and this kind of pushed you further, right, to kind of go and pursue this and and continue. And, and you, you mentioned that you made that promise to yourself. So that's how I kind of tie it in together, that it's like this engine that's, that's pushing you further towards your music, towards your healing, right? And then we can talk about also like, how music could be, you know, healing in many ways and the power of music and what it can do, you know, for, you know, maybe physically, but also like, you know, spiritually and all that. So that's how, what I took away from it. Um, but I'm sure that you will say it better than I, <laughs> than I just did. Yeah, no, that's basically it. I mean, that's exactly mm-hmm. what it is. I, I'm always very interested to know because there's, there's the impetus for creating the art, there's the mm-hmm. intention you put into it, and then there's how it lands on people. Right. And I really love that people can have whatever experience they need to have, which may be totally unrelated, but, but you know, it's actually very in alignment what you said. I don't think it matters why it happened. I think what matters is how can I be so in alignment with my soul, my heart, God, that, that, that energy just, um, it's like, the light expands and the darkness disappears. Instead mm. of fighting the dark, you expand the light. Mm. So I actually, I was very active on social media at the time. And I put a question out there. I, I, I did a blog post and I said, it was a very long blog post, uh, designing the roadmap for healing naturally from thyroid cancer. And then I said, I put it out into the universe, this question, how do I self heal from cancer? And one of the people who followed me, who I did not know at the time, 
and she'd been following me for a while and she's now a close friend of mine. She wrote back the answers in the question, you self heal. And I was like, huh, this isn't about cancer. This is about my life. I self heal. I look at every single aspect of my life, physical, emotional, spiritual, mental, no matter what I've done already, no matter how healed I am, no matter how self fulfilled I am or evolved I am or authentically self-expressive I am, there's always more you can do. So let's start an adventure finding out where, where can I bring more healing into my life? So like I said, the first thing I changed was the diet. You know, um, I did juicing. I became a raw vegan. I started working with an integrative oncologist and I did supplements and you know, everything, it remained stable, stable, stable. It wasn't growing. It wasn't shrinking, stable, stable. But it was only when I returned to my lost love of music, it started shrinking. Hmm. So the question there is what happens when we allow an obstacle, a challenge, an adversity to shake things up when we don't fight it, but we look at it and we're like, huh, how can I leverage this? You know, how can this actually serve me? How can this be a friend instead of a foe? Hmm. What's possible then? Now, I want to be clear that I'm not telling anyone what to do. This was my choice. It's an extremely personal and private choice. Nobody has any business telling anybody what to do right, at that moment in time in that decision. But I do offer the question in case it's compelling to someone else, what might happen? How might you look at things differently? How might you approach things differently? How might things unfold differently if you choose a different mindset? I think a lot of times people say, I can't. Right. And what they really mean is I won't or like I'm unable. And what they really mean is I'm unwilling. Not everyone. Yeah. Some people maybe literally genuinely are unable and they cannot. But I think a lot of people fall into the camp where they perceive themselves as unable or that they can't do something. And really they're not allowing themselves to get freakishly creative and just blow the whole thing open and say, if there were no rules, if I didn't accept as given anything, if my number one priority was, you know, healing or whatever it is we want to do, fill in the blank goal. If you make a decision, this is what I'm going to do, or this is what I want. And I'm going to do fucking everything. I'm going to turn the world upside down to do it. What might be possible then that would not be possible if you didn't make that decision and you didn't have that willingness and you weren't willing to go too far. Yeah. And you know, there's almost, I, I think sometimes there's also a sense of fear, right? Like that people, like you said, like unwilling, but also they're scared of failing. You know what I mean? And sometimes there's a certain comfort in just saying, I can't or I won't because you don't have that fear that, oh, maybe I won't achieve, right? Or maybe I won't don't have, get there. You also, you also don't have the responsibility. If right. It's like I a can't. comfort in it. Yeah. It's yeah. like throwing your hands up in the air and like, this is, this is happening to me as opposed to I'm making a decision about my circumstances or something like that. I, I actually have a poem about God as a scapegoat, but there are people who are like, oh, well, it's, you know, God has this plan or God. And I'm like, that's just lazy spiritual shit. You're just like, <laughs> you're just saying, oh, this was God's plan. It's like, do something about it. Challenge God, fight with God. When I started doing this, it was very uh, soothing for me mm. because I didn't have a place. And, and then I, like beyond me then having a place and a way, it's an invitation to anybody else. It's like, I'm willing to stand forward and say these things and do these things and maybe I'm standing alone, but maybe there's people who are also looking for something like this and I'm the watering hole, right? So now they can come and they can bring their friends and it can be like something new. Right, exactly. And you can be the catalyst for that for them. And 
and it passes down that way. So, okay, so let's go ahead um, and wrap this up. I did want to ask you a question because there's a lot of purple in the, in the music video and you're wearing purple now too. <laughs> so my favorite is, color. Is, 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 is there any more significance to it? Cause I know like the candle was purple or that was just. No, I mean, I mean, Yes and no. I mean, purple is my favorite color, but it also was my mom's favorite color, and she painted her house purple. And the bear, the purple bear, yeah, you know, that's a gift I gave to my mom when, like, right after she was hospitalized for a traumatic brain injury. And I walked into the gift store, and I couldn't believe that bear was sitting there because, other than the fact that it's a stuffed bear, it looked exactly like my mom. I mean, she wore that purple hat. She had those shades, and the T-shirt says, it's okay, I don't remember your name either, and she's always <laughs> forgetting people's names. Like, I grew up, when I was a little girl, I thought the Hoosie Wetses were, like, a very large family, because whenever anyone was coming over, they were always the Hoosie Wetses. So, um, yeah, so, so purple's definitely been a thing, but it's, you know, it's just I love purple. The last question I have is, why are the Iraqis in pajamas? There's a reputation um, in Israel that the Iraqi Jews were always wearing their pajamas. Um, and I just thought that was hilarious. Like, I Iraqi in pajama, like, oh, Iraqis in pajamas. And I was just like, I need to like create a band with that name. That's just a fucking awesome name. So to me, it was just very innocuous and lighthearted. And I just think it's a funny phrase. Um, you know, I, I came to learn later that it was, there were like derogatory con connotations and there was like a deep history mm -hmm. there because the Jews were stripped of all their property when they fled from Iraq. And so, you know, the men would go for an interview, they just have one suit and mm -hmm. they have very little clothes. So then they had, and, and by, the, you know, no matter how they were doing financially in Iraq, when they came to Israel, they were impoverished. So, mm. you know, they'd have like pajamas, they'd have their suit, they have very little clothes to wear. So when they were not in their suit for work, they'd wear their pajamas, right? So there's mm. like some deeper socioeconomic political stuff. That's not where my head was at at all. It's just, I just thought Iraqis in pajamas is really fucking funny. And I'm always in my pajamas. I mean, <laughs> like I started working for myself right out of college and i'm just too fucking lazy to put on clothes <laughs> so it was also just ex extremely apropos that you know as yeah. a freelancer you know self-employed solopreneur for like 30 years i'm just always in my fucking pajamas like you know if i put on jeans it's like a rocking day and I'm getting yeah <laughs> it's like oh we're doing something different today I think yeah. <laughs> everybody everybody feels that now um so right now uh now we're all in pajamas yeah I think we can go ahead and wrap this up yeah so thank you Lulwa this has been Welcome. awesome and thank yeah you. I enjoyed it as well